Good evening, you all, and um, welcome the, uh, to, this, to this lecture by Professor Daniel Mahoney of Assumption College entitled uh, Christianity and the Religion of Humanity. I'm Ben Story, the co-director of Furman's Tocqueville program, which along with the Ernest J. Walters Lecture Series in Political Thought and Furman's Political Thought Club is uh, sponsoring this afternoon's lecture. The, um, as we begin, I want to make like a stewardess and ask everyone to turn off their electronic devices as they may interfere with the lecturer's navigational equipment. The, uh, I also want to play the pedantic college professor and remind you that off according to the Oxford English Dictionary, means discontinued, stopped, or given up, the, um, not the uh, silent but still monitoring yik yak and Instagram. Uh, before we begin, the, um, I want to say a word about our sponsors. The Tocqueville program exists to encourage serious and open engagement with the moral and philosophic questions at the heart of political life. The Tocqueville program includes a whole range of courses and extracurricular, and extracurricular activities you can find out about from the materials beautifully arrayed on the table just outside this door. We are supported by a broad coalition of philanthropic organizations and generous individual donors, the, um, including our founding donors, Ginny and Sandy McNeil, the, um, and the Andrea Waite Carlton Fa uh, Family Foundation. Our sponsors support the Tocqueville program in the belief that genuine liberal education uh, encourages students to become more thoughtful citizens and more dignified human beings, and we are immensely grateful for their support. Today's lecture is also sponsored by the Ernest J. Walters Lecture Series in Political Thought. The Walters Lecture Series was established in 2001 to honor the life and legacy of Professor J. Walters. The, uh, Professor Walters dedicated his professional career to Furman University, teaching in the Department of Political Science for 27 years. After his death in 1997, Members of the political science department decided there could be no better way to honor his contribution than to continue his legacy with yearly visits by distinguished lecturers in the area of political thought. This annual lectureship has been established by the students Professor Walters inspired and the friends and family that he cherished. Our third sponsor today is the Political Thought Club, a group of 15 to 20 intellectually and spiritually vibrant students that on a purely voluntary basis the, uh, gathers every Friday afternoon at 2.30 in the political science department to spend an hour discussing some great text of political philosophy. The, um, if you're philosophically inclined, please feel free to join us any Friday afternoon. Also, after the lecture, the, um, that screen over there will magically disappear, revealing a sumptuous array of tasty snacks. Please stick around to chat with our lecturer and find out more about our activities then. The, um, that's it as far as general things. I'll turn it over to my colleague, uh, Ty Tessador, who's going to introduce our speaker. Um, it's a particular pleasure for me to be able to introduce our speaker this evening. Um, Professor Daniel Mahoney is both a former colleague of mine and a longtime friend. Uh, during the years we overlapped at Assumption College, he was a touchstone of sober good sense and generosity. During one of those moments of conflict and political turbulence that periodically erupt in the campuses of small liberal arts colleges. Uh, Dr. Mahoney was a steady and refreshing presence during those years, ones that, one that I still remember fondly and with gratitude more than 20 years later. Professor Mahoney occupies the Augustan Chair in Distinguished Scholarship at Assumption College. He earned his BA at the College of the Holy Cross and uh, went on to do a PhD at the Catholic University of America. I think what is most striking and revealing about Professor Mahoney is that he is both a voracious reader and a prolific writer. And he does both activities covering a broad array of subjects. In fact, by the time he went up for tenure uh, at Assumption, his publication record had already exceeded that of the entire faculty. No small feat. Professor Mahoney is author of over 120 introductions, books, articles, and book reviews. I won't go through them all. His writings have been translated into French, Italian, Russian, Hungarian, 
Norwegian, and Portuguese. He's made over, well over 100 presentations at professional and public conferences. And a sense of his range can be gleaned if I read the titles of a few of his books. Uh, the Liberal Political Science of Raymond Aron. De Gaulle, Statesmanship, Grandeur, and Modern Democracy. Alexander Solzhenitsyn, The Ascent from Ideology. Bertrand de Juvenal, The Conservative Liberal and the Illusions of Modernity. And one I, that's not uh, patterned on a specific person, but I love the subtitle. Defending Democracy Against Its Enemies and Immoderate Friends. Um, whereas many scholars would be inclined to focus their scholarship on a single author, uh, Professor Mahoney has been able to develop expertise in several. He's also one of the very few scholars that I've met whose first draft is typically close to the final product. This is a capacity that is as enviable as it is rare. Most of us have to work hard to make our words say what we intend them to say. Dr. Mahoney's writing is consistently fluid, clear, and always provocative. I am confident that the very same qualities will be fully evident this evening as he speaks to us about Christianity and the religion of humanity. Please join me in welcoming Professor Dan Mahoney. Well, it's a real pleasure to be here. I, uh, I've told everyone I've met today that I woke up at 3 o'clock in the morning and was at Boston Logan Airport at 4.30 and on a 6 o'clock flight to Charlotte, and I've been keeping myself awake with lots of Diet Coke all day. But I'm still awake and anxious and uh, to, to present my thoughts with you today. Um, let me say a little bit about the title of the paper. Actually, I was writing the paper. I changed the title to The Humanitarian Subversion of Christianity. That, that's tougher. But uh, well, let's stick with the original title for a little while, Christianity and the, Relig uh, and the Religion of Humanity. Uh, as you're going to see, I use the term religion of humanity in several senses in my paper as coextensive with a belief in what I call human self-sovereignty, that human beings are sovereign over themselves and, and ought to recognize nothing outside or above the human will. I sometimes use it as a synonym for humanitarianism as an ideology. But it's important to remember that the religion of humanity is a real religion. It was invented in the 1830s and 40s by Auguste Comte, uh, August Comte is a fascinating and brilliant French figure. Um, he wanted to found a mass movement, the way Marxism became a mass movement. Uh, and uh, he wrote essays on, uh, he wrote a whole series, his big book on essays on positive science, postulated three periods in human history. The, th uh, the theological, which is basically religious superstition, the metaphysical, which is the philosophical, and the age of positive science, which is human reason come of age. Moreover, uh, Comte believed human beings were incorrigibly religious, but the only object of our religious devotion ought to be ourselves. In other words, the human race ought to worship itself. Now, on one level, I would argue, Comte's religion of humanity is something like the effectual truth of much of secular thought in the world today, that the religion of humanity is a real religion. But I would add this caveat. Um, Comte actually wanted, he came up with feast days. For example, Adam's, you know, the way the Catholic Church would, would uh, honor saints. There's a special day for Adam Smith and Francis Bacon and Rene Descartes. These great exemplars of the human race are sort of worshiped as the best uh, exemplars of a humanity becoming conscious of itself. So uh, Comte's 
religion, and, and by the way, Kump went a little crazy after the revolution of 1848. He wrote a letter to the Pope and the Tsar of Russia inviting them to come to Notre Dame where he was going to uh, crown himself the high priest of humanity. Yeah, and and he, you know, revolution was breaking out all over Europe and Comte was an anti-revolutionary. But he wanted, he says, the Pope and the Tsar, give up all this religious crap and follow me. And we, we will refound humanity on the solid foundations of positive science and this new religion of humanity. Does anyone know the one country in the world that was founded by uh, uh, adherents of August Comte? The motto of the Comtean movement was order and progress. What country is that? What's that? Brazil. The Brazilian revolutionaries that overthrew the monarchy in 1889, they were disciples of August Comte the one country in the world that took August Comte up on his project of humanitarian religion. So anyway, I think it's worth noting, worth knowing, that the religion of humanity in the, the full-fledged Comtean form really was a project for creating a religion in which human beings, the self-worship of human beings was the central object of that religion. Now, as I said a moment ago, my talk is going to culminate in a discussion of what I call the humanitarian subversion of Christianity. And I know that sounds like a harsh and strong conclusion. But before arriving at that harsh and strong conclusion, um, I first want to delineate some of the differences between a Christian attitude and a humanitarian ethos. It is commonplace in the contemporary world to identify humanitarianism and Christianity, to see secular humanitarianism, the evocation of compassion, human sameness, fellow feeling, and the accompanying obsession with social justice as the effectual truth of Christianity. Or it's sometimes said the secular variant, the secular successor to Christianity. Now my claim is quite to the contrary. Far from being the secularization of Christian charity, the religion of humanity finally culminates in nothing less than the self-deification of man. He did so very self-consciously with August Comte. And if you just think August Comte is a weirdo, John Stuart Mill, who's one of the major figures in the modern tradition of liberalism, wrote a book in 1844 on August Comte and positivism, essentially endorsing the religion of humanity. So we see that intimate connection between Millian liberalism on the one hand and Comtean positivism on the other. Um, in its most extreme and self-conscious form, this religion as a, uh, entails the self-enslavement of human beings. The self-deification of man goes hand in hand with the self-enslavement of human beings. That's one of the powerful and profound lessons of the 20th century. But totalitarian slavery is not the only possible outcome of humanitarianism. There are softer, more democratic versions of this humanitarian displacement of Christianity. In contemporary Europe, beginning in the 1960s. Probably, you, you, it was brewing for a long time, but you might say the cultural and moral revolution associated with 1968 marked that moment when Europe ceased to identify itself as a specifically Christian civilization. And humanitarianism has become something of a new civil religion in Europe displacing the Christian residues 
of what used to be called Western civilization. As I said to uh, the class I was lecturing to this afternoon, could one imagine a contemporary European statesman referring to the survival of liberal and Christian civilization as the great desideratum of our time, as Churchill and de Gaulle repeatedly did during the Second World War? No. The, uh, the draft European constitution that was finally rejected by voters in Holland and France a few years ago made no reference to the Christian roots of Europe whatsoever, despite efforts by the Poles and the Vatican and some others to remind Europeans of the Christian foundations of contemporary democracy. Humanity, sovereign humanity, has become its own paramount theme. In large parts of the developed world, democratic man has lost the capacity to look up, to transcend ourselves by acknowledging a moral and spiritual reality outside and above ourselves. No doubt there has been an intensification of fellow feeling, of a humanitarian sensibility. And I would be the first to acknowledge that that's not a, a wholly bad thing. In some ways, we are less cruel and more tolerant. But this humanitarian sensibility often takes the form, and it often took the form in the 20th century, of loving humanity rather than loving concrete human beings. That particular humanitarian sensibility is tied up with the totalitarian tragedies of the 20th century, where untold numbers of human beings were sacrificed to what Pope Emeritus Benedict XVI has so suggestively called the Moloch of the future. In other words, whole groups of people could be sacrificed for a better society in the future. So I want to suggest that humanitarianism, humanitarianism has both a hard and soft side. In the name of humanity, many intellectuals gave to support to the most horrible regimes in human history. Think of that great philosopher of human freedom, the existentialist Jean-Paul Sartre who was an indefatigable defender of the worst tyrannies in human history. He wrote an article for the French newspaper Liberation in 1951 calling Stalin's Soviet Union the freest country on earth. He went on to become an uncritical admirer of both Castro and Mao, all in the name of existential freedom, all in the name of emancipating humanity. So humanitarianism can subvert moral and intellectual judgment. That surely is one of the great lessons of the political experience of the 20th century. But, and I insist on this point, it would be a mistake to simply identify secular humanitarianism with its most extreme and self-destructive manifestations. Just as there is hard and soft utopianism, the gulag and soft liberal naivete, so there is hard and soft humanitarianism. Soft humanitarianism trumpets the indiscriminate affirmation of the other. Notice academics like to talk a lot about the other. That's academic talk, the other. I'll have more to say about the other. And compassion, fellow feeling, sympathetic identification, with he who is the same as us. Uh, Alexis de Tocqueville, for whom this lecture program and the uh, Tocqueville Project is named, uh, was a qualified defender and affirmer of human equality, but he was deeply worried about this tendency to reduce the common humanity of human beings to a sense of indiscriminate sameness. And they had a wonderful word in French to describe that, uh, that equality rooted in mere sameness. He called it the semblable, he who is the same as me, right? So Tocqueville's a very helpful guide because 
he thought there was a profound truth in equality, and he also thought that there were forms of affirming equality that were deeply destructive of human liberty and human dignity. This religion of the same displaces Christian charity with a broad feeling of sameness about the whole of humanity. We come to perceive others as like ourselves and wish to de deliver them from suffering and injustice. However, as Rousseau was the first to point out, the most sincere compassion always carries with it, along with the identification with the suffering other, the satisfaction and pleasure of not suffering oneself. So there's a moral ambiguity in compassion. Thank God it's them. You know, none of us terribly enjoy being pitied. Because when you're being pitied, the other one, the other person is sort of lording something over you, right? I think sick people feel that sometimes. They don't want to feel, be feel, felt sorry for so much. As Pierre Menant has argued, charity, I'm going to refer a lot to Menant, a, a wonderful contemporary French political philosopher. Charity is altogether different from the religion of the same, the religion of the semblable. Charity is the love of God, first and foremost, the love within the Trinitarian communion itself. By God's grace, we mere creatures participate in God's love. Quote, in charity, there is neither identification with the other nor return to the self, quite simply because charity frees us from the human plane of things and from this double and unique slavery to the other and oneself. The believer loves others because they are made in the image and likeness of God. We do not love others because they are the same as ourselves. And who is in the image of God? Every person who is seen according to charity. The one who is loved is called the neighbor. Think of the story of the Good Samaritan in the New Testament. As Pierre Menantes said, the neighbor is neither, neither the same nor the other person. In Menant's formulation, charity requires, quote, no subtle phenomenology of the same or the other. And by the way, we have these subtle phenomenologies of the same and the other. Uh, we have Martin Buber's I Thou, a rather sophisticated analysis of the, you know, uh, love becomes this I Thou relationship. Uh, Emmanuel Levinas, who is a very interesting thinker, has a whole phenomenology of the human face and how we see the other through the face. And, uh, and uh, you know, so there's an intimate connection between seeing the humanity and nakedness and vulnerability of the human face and um, acknowledging our fellow or common humanity. In contrast, the neighbor is described in Luke's gospel as the one who one meets. And I quote Menant again, on the road that goes down from Jeric Jerusalem to Jericho, the Samaritan has no difficulty recognizing his neighbor, unquote. There is no need for theoretical sophistication or tortured and fashionable reflection on the self and others. I've referred a lot to Pierre Menant, who's an astute analyst and critic of the religion of humanity. He points out that in the contemporary world, the religion of the neighbor and the religion of the same tend to be mixed and confused. Since the sign of charity is effective service to our neighbor, and humanitarians often accomplish effective service to our neighbors, it is easy to confuse or conflate the two. Um, 
Manant gives the example of a figure you won't know, but he's omnipresent in France, Abbe Pierre. Abbe Pierre is a sort of social justice activist in France, old bearded French priest who never talks about God. He's always talking about unjust social structures and the need for the victims to rise up and all of this. And uh, people often praise him, you know, his humanitarianism as an example of Christianity at work in the modern world. Or think of Mother Teresa, when, Mother Teresa, when, think of Princess Diana when she wasn't snorting coke and getting ch chased by the paparazzi, you know. She was turned into a secular saint, a humanitarian by the media. Uh, think of the difference between a Mother Teresa and uh, who constantly rooted service to others in a specifically Christian dimension. Um, there's a wonderful little book from the late 60s or early 70s by the great British writer and social witness uh, Malcolm Mugridge about Mother Teresa. And he asked Mother Teresa why she did what she did. And she responded, because I want to do something beautiful for God. The name of the book is Something Beautiful for God. I remember Mother Teresa and Princess Diana died the same week in early September 1997. I was watching television in Boston, and Liz Walker, the local newsreader, got on and said, Princess Diana died in the accident in Paris on a Saturday night. Mother Teresa died about four or five days later. And Liz Walker announced, another great humanitarian has died. Well, Mother Teresa of Calcutta did not identify, she did not self-identify as a humanitarian. And that's the difference between an Abbe Pierre, a Princess Diana, and a Mother Teresa. Again, I quote Manant, without judging persons, Abbe Pierre and Mother Teresa seem to me in a way to be opposite figures. One puts us in confusion, and the other helps us to get out of it. Mother Teresa never imagined that her function, or rather her vocation, consisted simply in caring for or nourishing the body, but in acting for the salvation of the unfortunate. And in fiercely denouncing abortion and other spiritual ailments of late modern society, she spoke with force and eloquence about the spiritual poverty of prosperous liberal societies. Read her Nobel. Uh, uh, address. She knew implicitly what Pope Benedict formulated with insight and eloquence in his encyclical Deus Caritas S, God is Love, paragraphs 28. Love does not simply offer people material help, but refreshment and care for their souls, something which often is even more necessary than material support. In the end, the claim that just social structures would make works of charity superfluous, you might say that's the humanitarian chimera per, uh, par excellence. If we create a perfectly just and humanitarian society, we won't need to be charitable or virtuous. That's what the Pope was critiquing in Deus Caritas S. And he says, such an understanding masks a materialist conception of man the mistake, mistaken notion that man can live by bread alone, Matthew 4.4. 4. A conviction that demeans man, I'm continuing to quote from the Pope, and ultimately disregards all that is specifically human. Now, I've spoken of Pope Benedict XVI. Um, in addition to being a Roman pontiff, he is, I think, one of the great theological minds of the last millennium. And in the next part of my uh, remarks, I'm going to draw on Benedict's thought for this reason. Benedict was the most thoughtful contemporary critic of the humanitarian subversion of Christianity. Some of you may have heard of his controversial September 2006 address in Regen uh, Regensburg, which people mainly remember for what he had to say about the choice Islam had to make between uh, rejecting violence and uh, 
and voluntarism, the idea that in the name of God we can do anything. But the heart of the a lecture uh, was about, the heart of the lecture uh, was based on a denial that Christianity is a humanitarian moral message. I say how bracing and liberating are those words and how much confusion, confusion they clear away. So a brief excursus on Benedict's theological and political reflection will better allow us to appreciate the ground of this judgment that Christianity is not a humanitarian moral message. And what I'm doing, going to do here is draw on about nine or ten different speeches and encyclicals and theological writings of Benedict. I'm not going to cite them all, but uh, um, I will quote freely from his work. For Benedict, Christianity is an eschatological religion, an otherworldly religion, that knows that the definitive state lies elsewhere, and that Christ did not come, I quote, to set up the city of God on earth. Christianity requires and demands loyalty and collaboration with the earthly state even when it is not a Christian state. The Pope cites Romans 13.1, 1 Peter 2.13.17, and 1 Timothy 2.2. 2. Catholics can quote scriptures too. That was an old Protestant critique of Catholics. I didn't know the Bible. Uh, of course, Pope Benedict has written a marvelous three-volume uh, work on Jesus of Nazareth, which is rooted in very serious uh, biblical exegesis. It, Christianity, helps provide an education in the virtue that allows a state to be good. But it also knows that one must ultimately, quote, obey God rather than man, Acts 5.29. It thus resists every form of totalitarian idolatry, and by the way, as I said to um, class this afternoon, I think the track record of the Christian church, especially the Catholic church, in resisting totalitarianism in the 20th century was very good. And of course, John Paul II, the Polish pope from 1978 to 2005, was a living symbol of that fierce spiritual and, yes, political resistance to totalitarian idolatry. The church's for Benedict, the church's eschatological perspective, its understanding that Christians are on a journey toward the other city, allows them to be healthy and also allows our states to be healthy when Christians succumb to humanitarianism, they risk being bad Christians and problematic citizens at the same time. Benedict also appreciates that the idea of liberation and other forms of modern radicalism, he calls it Jacobinism or the Jacobin tradition, too often takes the form of rebellion against an order of truth and an order of things. Such rebellion paradoxically also turns out to be a form of rebellion against the human as such, a rebellion against nature, against God, and against man. Authentic Christian humanism has nothing to do with antinomianism uh, or uh, rebellion against divine, natural, or positive law. Benedict argues that Christianity preaches charity. Listen to his words carefully. A charity which binds up wounds, helps in small ways, and thus makes it possible to put up with great privations in a spirit of joy and solemnity. Modern humanitarianism, in contrast, aims to raise consciousness. Gunter Levy, the great historian, says that's, that phrase is the great mystification of our time. A small cognitive elite, mainly academics, know the truth and they're going to raise your consciousness along the way to all the evils in the world. 
This is exactly what the Pope says. He says that this idea of raising consciousness is a Gnostic effort to reduce the, the human world to evil, to see evil everywhere. In other words, the fundamental stance of the human being ought to be rebellion. Humanitarians tend to see victims and cruelty everywhere and posit metaphysical rebellion as a solution to such all-encompassing evil. The problem in this moral stance, this intellectual stance, is there's no room for indebtedness as a spiritual and political stance. The great French political philosopher Bertrand de Juvenal once said, the wise man knows himself for debtor. That gratitude is the proper stance of the human being. Gratitude for the goodness of creation. Not an indiscriminate fa flailing against all the alleged evils in the world. Now in numerous lectures, addresses, and in his great encyclical Space Salvi on hope, Pope Benedict denies that hope, a proper theological understanding of hope, is coextensive with definitive progress in history and the establishment of what he calls a definitively sound society. There is no heaven on earth, and this is the more controversial claim, and strictly speaking, there's no simply just society. You know, our philosophers are preoccupied with theories of justice. They want to establish the just society. There are better and worse societies. There are societies that are worthy of our support and conviction. But strictly speaking, there is no fully just earthly city. Christians are not partisans of what the Pope calls worldly increase in well-being due to human efforts alone. That's the humanitarian sensibility. Historical consciousness, in this humanitarian view, historical consciousness replaces confidence in the natural order of things and in that other city, the city of God that promises to heal all wounds and allows charity to lift the hearts of human beings. Humanity, in both its hard and soft forms, places its hopes in the Moloch of the future, in the promise of a this-worldly solution to the human problem. For its part, Christianity looks forward to a kingdom which finally is not of this world. And Christians do not and cannot reduce theology and philosophy to what some fashionable theologians and philosophers called a praxis, which does not presuppose truth, but rather creates one. The reality posited by secular humanitarianism is material and economic, first and foremost, and has no place for God, who belongs neither to the practical realm or to material reality. The Jesus of liberation theology, for example, is no longer the Christ, but the spokesman for all the victims who were called to rise up and change society. In this view, there is no sin, but only oppressive structures. Again, I cite the French political philosopher Bertrand de Juvenal, who once said, humanitarian schemes presuppose a perfectly just society where no one is required to be just. For Aristotle and Thomas, in contrast, justice is a quality of the soul, of the will. It requires virtue on the part of human beings. Against the idolatry of history, against various humanitarian fantasies, Pope Benedict lauds a faith-based hope that is also faithful to human reason. Opening ourselves to signs of transcendence, we refuse the chimeras by which we deify history, the state, ourselves, and mundane economic, social, and political processes. Humanitarianism destroys the human form 
especially when it becomes a religion that closes human beings to the eschatological significance of human life, to the liberating promise of the other city. Benedict is a forceful critic of what he calls the self-limitation of modern reason, beginning with Kant's three critiques, because such a reason can no longer defend itself against its self-subversion, against fideism. Fideism is the view that we, you know, we, some, we believe something simply on faith, with no other evidence. Faith, which jettisons human and divine logos, and technocratic and positivistic reason, that's Comtean reason, Benedict recovers the liberating logos that allows true humanism to flourish. By the way, it's worth noting, you know, in the academy today, uh, our philosophers and, and our, especially our literature people, they denounce phallocentric reason and, uh, and uh, uh, rationalism and, uh, you know, they proclaim we live in an age of post-modernity where we no longer can affirm that reason gives us access to, access, uh, access to truth. It's really quite remarkable. You can picture Voltaire, you know, turning in his grave. That you get these robust defenses of human reason by two of the last three Roman Catholic pontiffs. It's a, it's a paradox worth reflecting on. Now in the next and longest part of my paper, I'm going to take my bearings from a great 1944 essay on the humanitarian religious attitude written by a Hungarian-born moral political philosopher, Oral Kolnai. I've edited a collection of Oral Kolnai's essays called Privilege and Liberty and other um, essays in political philosophy, and I regret not including this wonderful essay in the volume. It just appeared in a new collection of Kolnai's uh, writings called Politics, Values, and National Socialism. It originally appeared in the Thomist in 1944. Um, Kolnai is a quite interesting man. He was born in 1900 in Hungary. He spoke 17 languages. Uh, in his youth, he was a disciple of Freud for about six months and was appalled by the dogmatism of the psychoanalytic circles in Vienna. Uh, under the reading of Chesterton, he learned English and converted to Catholicism in 1926. And he also uh, became a noted phenomenologist, um, uh, worked under Husserl, and he wrote uh, Phenomenologies of Sexuality in a very interesting book called Disgust, a phenomenology of disgust. He was also um, a very early critic of National Socialism. He wrote the first critique of National Social Socialist Ideology in the German press in 1926. And uh, he later came to the United States and Canada before settling in England. And um, he sort of evolved from a, uh, uh, he became uh, a conservative, uh, uh, not a reactionary, but a conservative in the last 30 years of his life. And um, this essay, Humanitarianism and Religious Attitude, I think reflects some of Kolmai's deepening political and philosophical reflections. In any case, this essay that I'm drawing on remains the best, most discerning, and if I dare say, the most prophetic account of the humanitarian attitude and its difference with the religious attitude ever written. Already in 1944, Kolnai saw that we were increasingly under the sway of what he called a non-religious, immantinistic, secular, uh, secular moral orientation which may be best described as humanitarian. He saw that such a society took its uh, departure from human needs as such. Nothing outside or above our desires or fears could get in the way of the development and happiness of human beings. We increasingly live, he wrote, under the specter of the imminent sovereignty of human needs. Now some more generous forms of humanitarianism, he acknowledged, took into account the religious and aesthetic needs of human beings. But this, he thought, was a way station to a more comprehensive and consistent form of humanitarianism 
that would have no real place for genuine religion or genuine aesthetics. Kolnai, a refugee from Nazism and later from communist totalitarianism, was also attentive to the rise of crypto or secular religions, as he called them, that aimed at human self-deification while holding on to quasi-religious trappings. You know, Lenin, Stalin, and Hitler were seen as gods. Um, there was a kind of, with communism, an idolatry of history. The historical process replaced traditional understandings of good and evil. And both the Nazis and communists adopted Manichaean attitudes toward uh, enemies of the people. Uh, the Nazis toward the Jews, the Soviets to the Kulaks, the independent farmers who they brutalized and killed in the 1920s and 30s. Now, Kolnai had already wrestled with the question so ably raised by Pierre Menant in our time. Now, here I'm moving from totalitarian humanitarianism to sort of soft liberal humanitarianism. Uh, with non-totalitarian humanitarianism, are we dealing with the same human behavior informed by a different motivation? That was a question Manant had raised. Or is the content of humanitarian morality radically transformed in the process of giving it a new motivation? Kolmai suggests that morality as such is weakened and transformed under the humanitarian dispensation. As he puts it very strikingly, moral cognition itself is impaired. Our moral sense, without the, the aid of revelation, is a real datum of human life, a, well point, a point well made by traditional natural law thinkers, or by a statesman such as Lincoln. You read his Peoria address of 1854. He makes a marvelous argument against slavery based on reason and our natural moral sense. He says, why won't Southerners allow their little children to play with the sons and daughters of slave dealers? Because they know it's wrong, right? Um, Kolnai suggests, but Kolnai suggests that moral sense, as legitimate as it is within its own sphere, needs, I quote, the fully articulated knowledge of good and evil that only religion can provide. A non-religious human being can be a model of moral rectitude. We all know that. That's the oldest game in the room. You know, if you, you say there's an, in, uh, an intrinsic connection between religion and morality, but what about Uncle Harry? You know, Uncle Harry's a wonderful man, and you know he didn't go to church and didn't believe in God. And uh, and uh, in any case, no one doubts, no serious person doubts that a non-religious human being can be a morally serious human being. But Kolnai argues that irreligious morality is a very fragile thing in practice. Moreover, humanitarian and religious morality are always different in quality. The religious consciousness always has the support of a divine exemplar who informs the humblest moral act or decision and deliberation. Now, of course, natural morality does not make God its thematic center, but it is strengthened by the depth of soul that religion provides. Humility and reverence in human relationships risk losing depth, savor, and firmness without a religious point of reference. Now, what about mores? Students of political philosophy are interested in mores. It's a great theme in Tocqueville's work, and Montesquieu, and Rousseau. Mores are morally relevant social customs, manners, and morals. Kolai argues that they are even more ultimately dependent upon religion. Religion helps allow one to reconcile freedom, dignity, selfhood and vitality with the requirements of social discipline. Uh, Tocqueville's Democracy in America, especially the second volume, provides some 
uh, wonderful discussions of the intimate connection between faith and freedom, the spirit of liberty and the spirit of religion, and the crucial dependence of a well-constituted democracy on sound mores. And the source of those mores for Tocqueville is religion. But writing in 1944, Colnai is already worried that a well-intentioned humanitarian experiment is drawing on what he calls the dwindling resources of democracy and in the process leaves itself vulnerable to totalitarianism. In Colnai's view, democracy is increasingly parasitic on what it rejects in the name of human self-sovereignty, as man being in charge. Now, Kohle insists that moral motivation and moral content cannot be readily, readily separable. Irreligious humanitarianism has no room for the concept of intrinsic moral evil, that there are some evils that are simply evil in themselves. They can't be explained away by circumstances, social conditions, etc. Nor, Colnai said, did irreligious humanitarians have a proper understanding of what he called the moral seizure in human nature. By the way, these are points aptly made by Alexander Solzhenitsyn in his 1978 Harvard address um, uh, where he says, um, essentially modern humanism, modern liberalism, has a, uh, not only doesn't acknowledge intrinsic evil, but it has a hard time um, looking evil in the face, acknowledging its reality, and standing up to it. Now, of course, Christianity is not Manichaeanism. It affirms the essential goodness of being but also a primordial fall. I notice when I go to funerals these days that uh, everyone goes to heaven. You know, Uncle Harry, you know, somebody gets up from the family and says, Uncle Harry, let, I'm, I got Uncle Harry on the mind. Uh, you know, but this sort of, this, this sort of optimism that uh, evil isn't re very substantial or real and that, uh, you know, sort of everyone who dies was a good man and, uh, you know, I went fishing with Uncle Harry when I was 13, and he gave me presents. And, you know, there's this, uh, it, it's amazing, I think, in both mainstream and, and even, you know, in evangelical Protestantism and Roman Catholicism, there's no longer quite that old fashioned sense that evil haunts the human soul, that we're, we're facing a kind of a great moral drama of good and evil in the human soul and that we're all at the we're all dependent upon the mercy of God but traditional Christianity affirms a basic perversion of the human will and it recognizes that the great drama of good and evil in the human soul cannot be solved or overcome by means of historical progress, revolution, or social and uh, uh, adjustments. Such an awareness of moral seizure, of this deep seizure in the human soul, is entirely alien to the humanitarian attitude and makes it vulnerable to real manifestations of evil. Let me give you a good example that comes from Solzhenitsyn's great uh, philosophical novel, In the First Circle. Chapter 59 of that work is called Buddha's Smile. And it's based on a true story about Eleanor Roosevelt. Eleanor Roosevelt went to the Soviet Union in the late, in the, in 44, 45, and was given the, a tour of the Lubyanka. No, but it was Batryki prison. It was one of the worst prisons in the gulag system. And, uh, and Eleanor Roosevelt was, uh, she was not pro-communist, but for her, the communists were at least, you know, on the side of history. They were working for a more humane future. She wanted to believe the best about the Soviet experiment. 
So the Soviets um, cut everyone's hair, got rid of their lights, gave them Bibles and Korans and all of this. And as Solzhenitsyn records, Eleanor Roosevelt was deeply impressed by the rehabilitative justice that was going on in this gulag camp. And she praised the, the people who had invited her for their progressive views on punishment. Right, this is of course a joke. Uh, she, uh, she, she simply didn't appreciate a good, t good nature, humanitarian woman who simply could not appreciate the depths of totalitarian evil. By the way, one of the, uh, there, there was a statue of Buddha that was put in the corner of the room. And after the Bibles are taken out, the Korans are taken out, and, uh, and uh, you know, a hundred prisoners are shoved into a small, small space, they forget to take the statue of Buddha out of the corner. So this statue is sort of sardonically looking down on this farce, the modern humanitarian. Uh, and by the way, the book ends with uh, a correspondent for the French newspaper Liberation. It was a left-wing newspaper of the time, same one Sartre wrote for. And uh, prisoners from the Gulag are being trans, uh, uh, transferred in trucks that say milk, meat, I forget what the others were. But uh, uh, so this, uh, but the reporter for uh, Liberation files his story from Moscow and says, uh, it's obvious there's ample provision of food in Moscow these days, right? Again, he can't see what's right before his eyes. Not because he's an evil man, but because he's been taken in by a certain well-intentioned but wrong-headed humanitarian sensibility that had a hard time recognizing evil when it saw it in the face. Humanitarianism is also prone to a reductive situational ethics. It does not know evil qua evil. Evil becomes disease, maladjustment, deficiency in training or development. As both Colnai and C.S. Lewis both point out, C.S. Lewis wrote a, one of his last essays from 1963 was on a humanitarian theory of punishment, but his argument is very similar to Colnai's. A humanitarian theory of punishment has little room for retaliation, for punishment as part of a genuine legal and moral order. Punishing evildoers is frowned upon and treated as a cruel act of revenge. At the same time, Colnai notes humanitarians may glibly um, support the elimination of the unfit for life and the maladjusted as acts of higher morality. As we have seen, a certain form of contemporary humanitarianism is perfectly compatible with the non-recognition nay, the willful denial of the personhood of the unborn. This moral inversion tells us much about the inadequacy of a morality that simply takes its bearings from human needs. So we see compassion can have both dark and hard edges. Humanitarianism also goes hand in hand with hypermoralism and what we today call political correctness. No longer believing in the old-fashioned cardinal virtues. What are the cardinal virtues? Justice, courage, prudence, and moderation. Um, humanitarian moral moralizers work for a formally perfect world, formally meaning officially, brought about by activism, revolution, social crusades, consciousness raising, everything except for the cultivation of the virtue of the responsible individual. The perfection of humanity is freed from arduous moral demands of any sort. Hence, moral relativism and moral fanaticism can easily coexist in the humanitarian mind. Some of the most fanatical and moralistic people I know are officially relativistic. By the way, there's a great philosophical or phenomenological explanation of this in a book by Michael Pogliani, where he says, 
calls it a moral inversion. He says, you know, a, a certain kind of relativism where, you know, moral judgments are simply arbitrary. He says, the fact is we naturally form judgments. And but he, he says with this kind of relativism, those judgments go underground. And they're never subjected to the tribunal of reason. And then they come up, they come back up or back through the back door as a form of fanaticism that is uh, in no way held to critical examination. But it is, uh, I, I think, uh, Polanyi's is the best phenomenological discussion of how relativism and moral fanaticism can coexist in the same mind and soul. As Pope Benedict also highlighted, humanitarian morality is prone toward the materialist reduction of the human person. Welfare, I don't mean welfare like welfare payments, but simply the concern with physical welfare. Happiness, adjustment, needs are its catchphrases. Religion sees in man both fallenness and ontological nobility. As Pascal said about Christianity, it knows the truth about man. Humanitarianism displaces the spiritual nature of man and proclaims a groundless human self-sovereignty. Paradoxically, the new man god of humanitarianism is largely preoccupied with power and sex, what Kolnai calls the nether regions of his being. Thankfully, something in the human spirit will react against this new world, this new morality presided over by our humanitarian shepherds. More, uh, man aspires to something outside and above himself, and that something, contra Nietzsche, is not simply an act of will, but a free response of the human person to the nature of reality. Again, writing in 1944, Kolai predicted the birth dearth, in which demographers talk about today. You know, we wouldn't, uh, we wouldn't have uh, population growth in this country if it wasn't for immigration. European societies have seen a tremendous decline in births. Uh, there won't be a Russia by 2015 if, if, if present demographic trends continue. Um, he linked this birth dearth to our growing tendency to stop procreation and only to live in the presence of our human needs. He predicted we would dote on our children, while, but be overly concerned about their physical well-being, while ignoring or downplaying their higher spiritual development. Tocqueville, too, appreciated the strong link between the Christian religion and a proper sense of futurity. The severing of ties with transcendent reality would not and could not be good for the mundane world. Imagination, too, risks becoming sterilized without an appreciation of one's dependence on a, spirit, a superior reality. One cannot capture or invent a mystical or spiritual mood without an openness of the soul to that which is outside and above it. The imagination cannot simply fabricate a spiritual order. Con uh, contrary to the, con or to the common view of our time, men do not create their own values. Kolai had his own version of Leo Strauss's joyless quest for joy. He thought life in the humanitarian paradise would lose savor, joy, and psychic vitality. In a word, humanitarians w humanitarianism would defeat its own ends. In a striking passage, he wrote that the Puritans of old had more gusto and vigor than, quote, do the vitamin-conscious sovereign selves of an earth-controlling, labor-saving, streamlined modernity. The human soul revolts its soulless mass existence the alternative, if there is an alternative, is to open ourselves to the substantiality and nobility found in being itself. Quote, by emancipating the image from the exemplar, the privileged creature from its sovereign creator, humanitarian man has virtually destroyed his very humanity. He will recover his humanity, including even its undergrowth of psychic robustness, robustness as soon as he truly and intricately reasserts the greatest and most vital of his needs, ignored and maimed and stifled by humanitarianism, the need for a meaning of his life which points decisively and majestically beyond the range of his needs. 
just have a concluding paragraph. Coli's analysis is, in my judgment, wonderful, profound, and endlessly provocative. I have also suggested it is not a little prophetic. Perhaps what Menant and Benedict can add to his analysis is an appreciation of the increasing identification and conflation of religion and humanitarian, of religious and humanitarian attitudes. Today, too many Christians see religion as a this-worldly project for social amelioration. Of course, working to improve society is a legitimate concern of every conscientious citizen. They do not understand the arguments against liberation or simply just society where charity is superfluous. They believe that the church must take its bearings from a world whose heart and soul is humanitarian. They cannot tell the difference between Mother Teresa and Princess Diana or Abbe Pierre. Even the old Roman church, a stalwart against an endlessly self-radicalizing modernity, flirts with pacifism with its roots in Habesian self-preservation and declares the death penalty illicit. Teresa of Leisure had a special mission. Uh, she prayed for those who were dying. She wasn't worried that they were being executed. She was praying that they would convert before they died. Just, just you know, it's a, sort of an old-fashioned attitude by a Christian about the death penalty. It accepts a humanitarian theory of punishment and, confer, uh, and conf uh, confuses it with the gospel. In Europe, humanitarianism has become a full-fledged civil religion, the religion of humanity prophesied by Comte 175 years ago. Depoliticization, the loss of political will, goes hand-in-hand -hand with dechristianization. Already in 1910, the great Charles Peguy predicted that these two processes would form the heart of a post-Christian, post-political Europe. I offer no prognosis or solution other than the spiritual, philosophical, theological, and political clarity of learning and admitting that Christianity and humanitarianism are two distinct religions. That acknowledgement, it seems to me, is the beginning of wisdom. We need to listen to wise and salutary voices such as Col Nye, Benedict, and Menant if we are to see our situation clearly and find intellectual and spiritual strength to move forward. Christians need to say with lucidity and intellectual courage that the religion of humanity is not and never will be our religion. I do not recommend some anti-modernist diet Jeremiah but rather a dialectical engagement with the strengths and limits of the modern dispensation. Modernity is at its best when it draws upon an older, non-humanitarian wisdom that allows its virtues to flourish and that keeps its self-destructive tendencies at bay. And by the way, I think that point is perfectly compatible with the wisdom of Tocqueville. Thank you. of humanitarianism on a campus like this one is something like Habitat for Humanity. And it's hard to understand what harm that has ever done. The, uh, so what's... I don't think Habitat for Humanity has done any harm whatsoever. But I, but I do think the um, conflation of Christianity with a larger project of social transformation, this worldly amelioration, reducing um, our obligation to others to a, uh, a kind of indiscriminate compassion that's not well thought. I think that does, it does harm to both citizenship and it does harm to an authentic Christian self-affirmation. By the way, I'm not, I don't mean to be too, I sort of, I post things in a, in a, in a, not an overall way, but in a tough way, because uh, it's hard to get a hearing for the kind of critique that I'm introducing, um, because this conflation of Christianity and humanitarianism is so widespread and so taken for granted in liberal societies today. Some people see humanitarian, especially in Europe, I think they see humanitarianism as the, um, um, the thing that comes after Christianity. 
it, it's sort of indebted to it, but it leaves it behind. I think there are many well-intentioned Christians who don't appreciate, as, as Pope Benedict says, how when, the ob our obligations of charity are endless and limited, but Christianity is not reducible to a humanitarian moral message. That's the point I wanted to make. Three cheers for Habitat for Humanity. Um, I was struck by the um, your point about how the humanitarian one flaw of the humanitarian philosophy is they're they're so quick to jump to outrage, and right. it, it kind of reminded me of uh, Alain Yuval of then uh, says that uh, in the modern American context liberals approach political debates by seeing the problems and being outraged by them conservatives see things to be grateful for, and so I, my question I guess is even if you even if I were to agree with you that society, policymakers, Christianity should be more aligned to gratitude than to outrage, isn't there, aren't the people who are outraged often right? And aren't sectors of, the, of our society like academia, like the media, like the entertainment industry, aren't they, isn't, part of the, isn't it important that they are the ones who shine the light on things to be outraged about? Like, isn't that a valuable thing? Well, I would, I would quote old wisdom. Aristotle says being angry in the right way at the right time and the right manner is perfectly legitimate. It's in accord with virtue. So there's a time to be angry. And, uh, uh, but I think Pope Benedict was talking about a more comprehensive angry, anger that was tied to what I call metaphysical rebellion. This view that, um, you know, I just came across, we have a teaching forum at my college and uh, somebody in our human services department is giving a paper about how all of our students are come to college overcome by classism and racism. And it comes very, very close to the idea that especially young white men come to college ontologically guilty. You know, it reminds me of Stalinism, that you, you're in the wrong class, you're in the wrong group, you need to have your consciousness raised, you need to be told the untold evil that you and your parents and your class have subjected the whole of humanity. Um, look, uh, in, a, in a free political order, of course we want a lively press, we want, uh, we want citizens, uh, we want citizens to uh, get worked up where it's appropriate to get worked up, but that's different than this Gnostic view that the Pope highlighted, where all you see is a world of exploitation. You know, a, a one popular book that, uh, it, it pains me that the most, the best-selling book on American history for young people is Howard Zinn's People's History of the United States. If you read that book, you would have no understanding of why uh, Tens of millions of people have come to the United States and seen it as a land of opportunity and hope because it's an unremitting portrait of a regime that has only known slavery, racism, capitalist exploitation, cruelty, sexism, etc. You know, these are what Marx called the alien powers that rule the world. And, uh, so I think it's important to put things in perspective. You know, we live in a, we live in, I think, relatively decent societies and free societies. We need to see and appreciate their virtues. I think categories like racism and classism are mystifications that get in the way of a balanced and prudent political judgment. They get in the way of careful, empirical and philosophical analysis. So uh, I, I largely agree with you what you say, but I, uh, I would still insist that uh, if, if, if one understands what Pope Benedict was talking about, this ideology of consciousness raising is really destructive. Well, it's, 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 it's destructive of sound judgment, but it's also destructive of Christian charity. It sees, it's, it, it's not a sign of hope. It's not a movement forward. It's a concealed form of nihilism. I think that we've got a student up here. Um, so is there, 
are ontological guilt and like I guess gratification mutually exclusive to each other? And uh, furthermore, can can we not be like a prudent society if we have the classifications of like racism and classism, or is that totally like impede on that? My look, there there is such a thing as racism. I, I I don't quite know what classism means. I'll tell you, in the Soviet Union, millions of people were murdered uh, because on classist grounds. You know that they belonged to the wrong class. That uh, just as the Nazis used race as a justification for an eliminationist political ideology and strategy, so the communists used classism, class-based categories as a project for eliminating real or imagined enemies of the people. Um, I think we ought to be very uh, careful, very um, circumspect in accusing other people of being, who disagree with us. You know, in a typical college campus, if you make an argument against affirmative action in some people's eyes, that makes you a racist. That's silly. We, we should not use categories in a way where they get in the way of the possibility of civil and sustained and serious political discourse and moral discourse. Uh, back to this, the second question regarding the spokespeople for the society, the newspapers, the people in Hollywood and so forth. And I would just like a sense of one of the latest ones is that college campus is a uh, center for the rape culture. And the, the students here go along with that assessment of the college campus. Oh, this is a little far afield from my talk. Uh, there's a good article in the new issue of uh, First Things called Sex and Danger at UVA. And it talks about how uh, this whole discussion of rape First of all, there, a lot of this is exaggerated. The, you know, the, the, you know, we've seen these, these mendacious uh, uh, claims made at Duke and now at UVA. But the fact is, we want to condemn, um, and and I think understandably condemn, some pretty pre pretty reprehensible human behavior without condemning a climate of radical sexual promiscuity. Non-judgmentalism that's made possible, you know. So we want to hold on to an official understanding that completely rejects traditional moral and sexual understanding. At the same time, we get sometimes fanatical in condemning, um, you know, male rapaciousness. And uh, this article in First Things reminded me that. Um, you know, the, the decisions that were made in the 1960s uh, to integrate colleges, to, to, not to integrate, but to, to, to establish uh, institutions of both men and women, to, uh, to uh, allow uh, uh, sort of indiscriminate sexual activity and all of this. There were, there, you know, the old days when you had these single sex colleges and the boys would take the buses out to Mary Baldwin or something. A lot of things went on in the cars, you know, but they, uh, uh, there was at least some pretense that uh, there were forms that need to be respected. There are absolutely no, there's no pretense any longer that certain forms and, um, and restraints ought to be respected. So I, fi I, I, I find the whole rhetoric about sexual crime divorced from any appeal to modesty and self-restraint to be deeply and profoundly problematic. Of course, I'm full. I'm a realist. I'm fully aware that that kind of traditional idiom is not going to be part of our college conversation about human behavior and human responsibility. But it ought to be. I, well. I think you could say at the political or the philosophical level, one difference between an older liberalism and a newer liberalism, what I would call autonomy liberalism, is the older liberalism was very conscious of the fact that 
a free society where people had a degree of autonomy depended upon authoritative social institutions like the family, the churches, um, which shaped judgment and allowed us to exercise freedom in responsible ways. Now, liberty in this humanitarian understanding has been transformed into sort of full-fledged human autonomy where we're simply free to choose uh, uh, regardless of uh, the content of the choice. And um, that's a different, that's a radically different, that's, you know, uh, our, if you look at our theories of justice, if you look at what, call, what calls itself democratic theory and in, 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 in political theory today, the theme of mores has simply dropped down. But these are the crucial and indispensable prerequisites of a free and decent society. And that's why we need, we need Tocquevillian wisdom. We need that older, chastened liberalism that knew that, um, that, that liberty was not an absolute end in itself, but needed to be informed by a, uh, a, a, an, an, under, an understanding of human virtue that is, um, yeah, but I mean, to tell, to tell young people that they're just free to do what they want is not an invitation to uh, a civilized society. And I should have made it at the beginning, but forgot. The, um, we were supposed to have Cornell West and Robbie George here in uh, March, and they got snowed out. That event has been rescheduled for October of next year, October 22nd. I mean, if any of you are in interested, let's, um, there will be a reception right here momentarily. Let's thank Dan Mahoney for his time.